Okay. I'm, I'm ready to go if you guys are ready. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Woo! Good afternoon. How's TC going for everybody? Woo! Yeah. Oh, wow. Is this the like after lunch? I'm really tired. All right, well, we'll do, we'll do jumping jacks. We'll try to get you going. I'm uh, welcome to Moonshot. My name's Hillary Fire. I'm a managing director at Slalom, responsible for our global data and analytics practice. And I am fortunate to be joined by three of our top partners today. We've got Tableau, Snowflake, and AWS. In 1961, John F. Kennedy laid out a bold vision. We want to land a man on the moon and return him home safely before the decade is out. And in 1969, 50 years ago, that vision became a reality. Not only was it a really ambitious plan, but think about all the systems and data it took to pull off that historic mission. From altitude to thermal to thrust, to angle of re-entry, you get the picture. It was going to take a culture of data to pull that historic mission off. These folks needed to have procedures that were practiced, contingency plans rehearsed. The astronauts needed to be empowered in case communication was cut off. And there was a ton of training it took to pull off that historic mission. And yes, there was technology, but I love this quote. Apollo was the combination of technologies, none of which was particularly dramatic. Apollo was a triumph of management, not engineering. Kennedy's bold vision alone didn't get us there. Having the right technology alone didn't get us there. Having data, even though I love data, it didn't get us there. It was actually the collection of all these things together and the people having this culture of data. And we heard this morning during the keynote that culture eats strategy for breakfast. I thought that was a great quote. They had that culture of data. And we, were, we got to thinking that this was a perfect metaphor for all of your moonshot ideas. So as you are moving forward with your organizations and your moonshots, a culture of data can be the rocket fuel for helping you achieve that moonshot. Now when I talk about modern culture of data, what do I mean? Because in the modern era, a common pocket calculator has more compute power than the compute power to land the man on the moon. And our smartphones have millions of times more compute power than all of NASA's combined computing for 1969. So with the advent of the internet, the smartphone, and the clouds, we've seen this huge democratization of decision making, particularly in our personal lives. So I'm just going to take you through some personal decisions that I've had recently. How many of you traveled here to come to TC, to Vegas? Yeah, pr pretty much everybody. So what's the first thing you did? Well, I know what I did is I checked the weather, because it's pretty rainy at home, and I was pretty excited to see all that sunshine. I'm based in Seattle, so having sunshine in November is awesome. Well, I, I used that data to figure out what I was going to pack. And then, when it was time to head to the airport, what did I do? I popped open my smartphone, I took a quick look, and it said, it's going to take you about 22 minutes to get to the airport. So all this data, I'm making all these micro decisions. And then ultimately, I get real-time alerts from my airline. So all of you, how many of you use data to make a personal decision today? A good portion of you. Now, how many of you feel like you have that same access to data to make decisions every day in your business life? Raise your hand. Look around the room. It's a lot fewer hands went up. So what's the difference? Well, first, it's a modern culture of data. And, and what, do we, what do I mean by a modern culture of data? First and foremost, a modern culture of data is a mindset and a belief that making data-driven decisions will be make better decisions using data. 
It's a belief that if you have accessible, trusted, and secure data, you can unlock the collective potential of your people. And ultimately, it's when every person in your organization can and does use data to make decisions, basically taking a page from our personal lives. So why does it matter? Well, the whys may be different depending on your organization. I want to disrupt or avoid being disrupted. I want to create the most incredible customer experience. I want to uncover the unexpected. I want dot, dot, dot. Whatever your want is, a modern culture of data can be the rocket fuel to get you there. And in the age of disruption, where for many organizations, data is their business, people are looking out for ways to not be disrupted. So when I think about Uber, who is Uber disrupting? Shout it out. Taxis. Taxis, yeah, great. What about rental car companies? If I think back to when I used to travel 20 years ago, my decision-making process was a lot different, right? I showed you I used my smartphone. 20 years ago, when I left for the airport, you know what I had to do to check the what, like traffic? I tuned into a radio station, and it was stale, and it was guesswork. It was a lot of gut feel and remembering what to do. It was just a different era. I rented a car everywhere I went. Now I never do. I take an Uber just about everywhere when I travel. So, for Avis, this is a huge disruption. And they luckily don't consider themselves a rental car company. They actually consider themselves a mobility company. And their moonshot idea is to take connected car data to really create that excellent connected car experience and be that mobility company of the future. So with Avis, we were fortunate enough to work with AWS on a proof of technology to see how the cloud could really move them on their mission. And we did a ton of cool experimentation. And I'm not going to go into the details of all the different experiments, because a lot of times when you're trying to land on the moon, your first step isn't landing on the moon. And their first problem was actually a pretty straightforward problem. It was a $40 million opportunity but it was fairly straightforward. And that was to optimize their fleet of vehicles. How many of you have leased a car before? A couple of you, quite a few of you. What happens when you go over the allocated mileage allotment? You pay. You pay lots. So imagine if you have a fleet of 650,000 vehicles, and a good percentage of those are leased. That can get really expensive really fast. So their opportunity is how do I optimize my fleet and make sure I ideally stay below the line. So I have one access that's the odometer reading, the other access that's the vehicle age, and in a perfect world, I've walked just under the line to optimize my, my fleet. And anybody over the line, we want to pull them back down so we don't get charged. Well, what am I going to do to help the person who's making the decision to prep the cars? Well, the best thing I can do is go on the lot and watch the process they go through. So we went to Newark Airport, and we watched them prep the cars. So they go from one to two, and three is the go line. So they get cleaned and readied. Three is where they're lined up for rental for the next guest. So we ended up creating a machine learning algorithm that looked at odometer readings, but also looked at a number of other factors, like customers that are going to be coming in soon that often get upgraded, et cetera, and took all that information and put that information in the hands of the person prepping the cars. Now, if you're prepping the cars, you're pretty busy. You don't have time to decipher some really complex calculation. So what we did is a really simple color coding system. We basically, on their mobile device, did a red, yellow, green, blue to line up the cars. And that is a modern culture of data in action, empowering the people with data to make data-driven decisions at the point of decision making. 
So all systems go. Some of you have go, no go cards on your chairs. Some of you don't because we have more chairs here than we brought go, no go cards for. We probably should have used a little data on that one. Um, but those of you I mean, that don't have cards, I want you to raise your hands if you're a go. So you put your hand up if you're a go, otherwise you leave your hand down. I'm gonna ask a series of questions. Oh. When I'm making decisions, I always consult data. Go, no go. Oh, there's actually a pretty good mix of green. That's pretty good. That's because you guys are all the data people in the room. This is a Tableau audience. I have easy access to the data I need. Oh, a lot more no-goes. Good, I was expecting that. In fact, there were very few hands that went up in the back. It's like, got quiet back there. I can trust the data to make decisions. That's actually a pretty good blend. What's funny is this side, well, no. It's a pretty good blend, but a little more no-goes, just so you know. And I trust my team to accurately interpret the data. I expect in this audience more goes because of the literacy. Yeah, awesome. Well, you know what? You, I, you are not alone if you had a lot of no-goes. And Adam talked a little bit about this already. 92% are failing to scale analytics. This was a McKinsey study of over 1,000 companies. That's pretty poor in, in statistical speaking. So if you're in that 92%, how do you become part of the 8%? We use this modern culture of data framework, and it's made up of five elements. The first is vision. And vision is really about the moonshot idea. You want to make sure that there's a bold vision, a line strategy behind it, metrics that are there to ensure you're actually marching against that strategy, and you have strong executive commitment against that. Our second element is transparency. Transparency is about accessing the data and this is really the platforms and tools that make that accessibility possible. Our next element is guardianship. Now, guardianship is about the secure, ethical tre treatment of data, which ultimately leads to trust. If you don't trust the data, then you're not going to leverage the data. Now, in many organizations, this is a balancing act. Guardianship is either completely forgotten, and it's the Wild West, or it's completely locked down, it's over-restrictive, and you as the business user don't have access to the data you need. So there is a balance that, that you need to strike, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some of that balancing act when we get to small steps later. Literacy. Literacy is about speaking the language of data. That's what a lot of folks here in Tableau know very well. It is having that data know-how, having the talent and skills, having those communities that are supporting the literacy, creating those templates to really make it easy to share and build skills across an organization in an enterprise way. And the last piece that's often forgotten about is that squishy little center piece called culture. Now, culture is a really interesting thing, and it can be often an elusive thing to move. Culture is about the behaviors, the core values, the operating model that really change the ways of working in an organization. So we will come back, and I will share a couple of tips on how you can start moving the needle. But before I do that, I want to actually pass the baton to Todd Talkington from Snowflake, who's going to dive deeper into our first element of transparency. Thank you. Ready? Whoa. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Uh, enjoying Tableau Conference? This is, yeah, it's great. The, uh, the thought of what we were talking about is, is spot on. 
Um, when you look at analytics, it is a comprehensive uh, model. You need to look at everything. So Hillary is absolutely right in how she's approaching this. And what I'm going to talk about is the transparency component. So what is transparency? Transparency, in my mind, is making sure people have an idea where to go get data and how to go get it, to efficiently go get it so that they can solve problems. Without that, you, that's where you have the issues of really not being able to get to where you want to go. Um, it was really cool to see Danielle Beringer uh, speak today from Nissan. Um, very randomly, I had no idea she was going to be here, but I was at their kickoff when they started this program seven years ago. And to see the progress that she made is amazing. The, at the kickoff, she, I, if I remember right, her title was a, a, a manager within IT, and as you saw, she's a chief data officer today. And you could see the passion and the vision behind what she was trying to accomplish as she talked through it in that kickoff. She brought IT and the business together in a huge room. They talked about how they go get data. They talked about where to get data, where to go when you have questions, where to go when you need help. Now, there's a lot of linear process through that. You change culture and other things, so there's a lot of things to pay attention to. But the transparency of the data is a key element. If you can't get to the data and you can't use the data, it's a, it's a much, much harder process. So what we'll talk, today, talk about today is um, some of the challenges that we've seen, right? What are the challenges that, that customers hit when they, when they look at data and how to get it to people? Um, and some of the ways around that. And then we'll follow up with a, a, a customer story that kind of wraps that together. So I'm in a unique position because uh, I, I'm at Snowflake today. Um, I spent six years at Tableau prior. During that six years, I was really able to see because modern analytics really was in its, in its infancy. Um, but I was able to see customers and watch them as they grew into what they're doing and was able to learn a lot through that. The, um, the challenges that customers face, it's almost a domino effect, right? If you don't start with the right things, other things begin to influence those decisions. So for example, I'm sure if I were to ask how many of you have siloed data, we would have a pretty much every hand up here, right? Um, and that's true. You gotta think back about where did all this start? And 40 years ago is where it started, when we started bringing systems into the business. So each, each division, each group makes their own decisions. We have a multitude of systems, some of them very, very difficult to, to do anything with outside of the system, uh, spread across the organization, and it just grows. So in that world, and where we are today, don't match. We are not able to go find all the data that we need. Um, while at Tableau, there's a product that they have that's called Alpo, and eat your own dog food, right? So we use Tableau to be able to go look at our, our data. We had a database that we could go get pretty much any data that we wanted. Now, that's where I did some of my best work. Someone might come to me and say, you know what, Todd, here's, a, here's some data, here's, here's what I think. If someone just gave me the report and I wouldn't have any ability to question it or think about it, I have to accept it. But I was able to go to Al Alpo, bring that data out, and challenge those thought processes. It made my business better, right? So that siloed approach is the first domino. That's the first thing you really need to think about. Because beyond that, you start to look at, okay, how do we scale? Well, again, we've got all these systems that, that have been built over the years and uh, trying to tie those together. So let's hire someone to come in and tie them all together. Then we've got to get the data to the people. Well, now these systems that weren't really designed for people to go in and pull data from, they were designed for one person to go do that. We're trying to change the concept of that, those systems and make them, make them work for us. You're not able to get all the data to the right people, so you're not able to scale within the organization. And then finally, you, obviously it gets very complex and, and, and costly on the back end. You're hiring, you're, you know, you're building new systems, you're trying to make them all work, you're hiring people to do that. That whole concept um, begins to kind of fall within itself. And the, res and the result in that is that you don't have the ability to, to allow people to go quickly understand their business. So 
How do you fix that? Now, again, in the concept of what we're talking about, it's everything. You need to look at it all. Within this piece, one of the things to look at is how do we get the data into one place so that everyone can get to it? Alpo, for example. That's a key element that allows you to move forward in a much, much more effective way and understand um, where you're going, right? When you have the data in one place, and obviously as the cloud has moved along, we've, we've, you know, a lot of people are shifting to the cloud, and that's a primary place that people are going. But once you do that, you're allowing your business to start scale. You're, more and more people are able to go grab the data they need and find it. You get better at, better at storing that data and making it, and making it uh, a place where everyone can safely and, and organized way go. The costs go down um, for a multitude of reasons, but you don't have many systems you're trying to keep all together. You have one that you're maintaining. You don't have, um, you know, within uh, Snowflake, for example, specifically, when you're not using it, it shuts down. You're not spending it. If you have to go, if you need a lot more horsepower, it'll ramp up and, and give you more horsepower. But there's a lot of ways that when you're in that one system and focused on that, you begin to be under control. End result, faster decisions. In my experience, I was able to play with the data and make better decisions. If you were at the keynote, um, Diana, or Danielle Barringer said it, she's like, they're, they're making multi-million dollar wins through the data that they have and the culture they have for Nissan, right? And so that's the things that you want to consider when you're looking at transparency and understanding how that affects the rest of the business. I'll give you a quick example. Um, EA is a, it's a uh, video game or it's gaming uh, software and they have a bunch of games. And what you have to remember is that they have data coming from all of their users. When you're using a game, they have data they can download to see how their systems are being interacted with and understand uh, you know, how they can best respond. So pr their previous system was very, very difficult. They have all that data coming in, they'd have to in download it every single night. When they downloaded, it would take six to eight hours to get it all in the system, and hopefully it worked. And if it didn't work, then they would have to pull back, wait another day, and then re redo it and put it back in. So you're a day off. Um, the other thing that happened is that they had peak hours. So there are seasons where they would I mean, it'd be a massive growth that they needed. Under the systems that they had, they had to scale those systems somehow, which was very, very difficult. Afterwards, what they were able to do is, and they did use Snowflake, but they, what they're able to do is look at it from a different perspective. The load times were causing a big problem because what happened was they would load the data six to eight hours. They, uh, um, if you're in the US, it was at nighttime. The loser was Australia because it's a 24-hour clock in of analytical, uh, analytical working, right? And so Australia is sitting there during business hours not able to do their job. Um, in this case, after they did it, because of the way Snowflake works, they were able to load the data. It had no effect on, the, on the, uh, the analytics they were doing in Australia. They could load the data. No one else knew they were loading it. The, um, the other thing is, is that they were also now to lo able to load the data during the day. So if there was a failure, and they had to restart over, they had the time to do it. So now their reporting's becoming much more accurate as well. And a third effect was the, um, is the, uh, uh, where am I? The, uh, <laughs> well, the, third, the third, third effect was the, um, where, uh, was the load, uh, yeah, the load times, they had the, uh, the load times, yeah. So they, the, they were able to load their data and get it in, and everyone was on it. They were able to uh, um, also get their, their, uh, the areas that they were, they were uh, not able to, the, the reporting right. So point is, is that what they were able to do is get everything and do it in a much more effective and efficient way. The bottom line is that with that, with that ability, their business is going to run much more effectively. So transparency is very, very, very key and something very important to look at. So I'm going to invite Jorge up next, and he'll start talking about the uh, guardianship. So thank you. Thanks, Todd. OK. So guardianship. So I think we can all agree that data has become a, a, a very important factor on many organizations' business model. And I think. Um, 
actually, Amazon is a good example of it. If you look at this diagram here, uh, what says that it's kind of a, a very simple representation of uh, Amazon's uh, early business model. And it's all focused on the customer experience. The idea is if you are able to improve the customer experience, then more people will come. And with more traffic, obviously more sellers will want to um, place their products on your properties, which increases the selection and by definition then uh, you improve the customer experience. So it creates kind of a flywheel. And this is kind of a simple idea, but um, what's often overlooked is what's behind all this model. And what's behind is data. And the key point here is that if you, as an organization, can collect and analyze every relevant data point about your business, then that will enable you to make better decisions, which results in better products through innovation, that drives more users who actually generate more data, and then you have even more data to make even better decisions. But to do this, you need the right data architecture. So as Todd was talking, like the siloed data is really not the approach. One of the things that uh, we have found is many customers are actually taking their legacy data warehouses, modernizing them into the cloud, and then creating also this type of data lake architecture that basically allows you to store massive amounts of data in a central repository, and then uh, making it available to a very broad set of users who can then use also a very broad set of analytic engines to slice and dice the data, run experiments, and with more experiments comes more innovation. The more experiments you can run in the less time at the lowest cost, the more you can innovate, and that's how companies are using data to innovate and generate competitive differentiation. But of course, with more data comes more responsibility. So uh, in order for this to work, you need uh, governance. In this area, AWS provides uh, services uh, to secure your data, services to audit, to monitor, to identify authentication, uh, authorization, encryption, both um, in rest as well as uh, in motion as well as compliance programs uh, to help you certify and comply with the different uh, regulations. And this is really important um, because also in light of uh, all the new regulations. And so, so how can organizations start? And usually what we've seen is that there's a ton of questions that need to be answered. And uh, the interesting thing is that if you ask a CFO about the balance sheet, cash on hand, uh, debt, liabilities, assets, etc., they can immediately answer all those questions. But if you ask a CDO or a CIO, it's a different story. Like, when, uh, where are you storing your sensitive information? What type of sensitive information are you storing or capturing? And the problem is that all these new regulations are actually turning the equation. And data is also becoming kind of a liability. Because what used to be directives, best practices, recommendations, guidelines, there are now laws in effect. And they can have devastating effects for many businesses. If you think about GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, in Europe, the fines can be as high as 20 million euros or 4% of global revenue, whichever is higher. So how can companies kind of turn this liability into an asset that they can leverage for competitive, uh, intelligent, uh, competitive differentiation? Uh, one of the key aspects of it are data catalogs. So data catalogs are key, not only from a, a compliance and regulation a point of view, uh, but also for new initiatives. Data catalogs can help you answer many of the questions that I show in uh, my previous slide, but they can also help uh, drive new initiatives. 
For instance, if you want to create a new machine learning algorithm, you first need to go back and see what data is available to you. The more data you have, the better quality data that you have, and the more accessible it is, the more relevant it is, the better your algorithm will be, the better predictions you can make. And again, this is something that the data lake architecture enables, but also is key to have a, a way to actually find, document, audit, and trace information assets through data catalogs. Another in, in, important aspect, uh, and this may seem obvious, uh, to be familiar with all the relevant regulations in your industry. Any data application needs to be designed with security in mind and also being very conscious about all the different regulations. On so this area, AWS provides compliance programs that can help you certify for almost any regulatory agency around the globe. Another aspect is privacy. Uh, of course, a lot of the recent regulations uh, are focusing on privacy, not only GDPR, but also in the US, the uh, California Consumer Primacy, Privacy Act. Uh, CCPA. So if you look at uh, many of these uh, challenges, they all revolve around PII, so personal identifiable information. If you think about data breaches, uh, they are only relevant if they contain PII. Second party misuse, same thing, it's PII. Even the very popular uh, right to be forgotten. It's PII. If you don't have PII, then you, you minimize the risk. So at AWS, we took a very uh, unique approach to data privacy, and we asked the question, well, what would, it, what would happen if we actually strip all the PII from our data lake? And the answer is that in most cases, you can still derive significant value from your data if you don't have that personal identifiable information. So one of the solutions that we develop is actually a, what we call a de-identified data lake, which allows you to actually scan all the data as it co is coming uh, to your data lake and de-identify it uh, before it even lands in your data lake. So that way it allows you to minimize risk and also uh, leverage the data for competitive advantage. Now, so far we've been talking about an architecture that allows you to leverage data as an asset. And one point that I want to uh, leave with you is that uh, so far companies have been using data as a way to gain operational efficiencies. That's been kind of the common denominator across the board. Uh, so the company of the, of the past or of today will say, hey, this data architecture is helping me save $10 million a year or X million dollars a year uh, because I'm finding efficiencies, I'm finding uh, cost savings, areas for opportunities. But now organizations, this type of architecture is allowing organizations to actually use data to generate new streams of revenue, to penetrate new markets, and actually are creating data products so a baseball organization is actually creating a data product to try to gain new audiences, to engage more of the users. A tractor company is generating data products that is selling now to seed manufacturers. Why? Because they are collecting a lot of data. So even the most traditional organizations are now becoming data organizations, technology organizations. In fact, a study from McKinsey Institute found that uh, on a study over three years, organizations that are showing over 10% of growth, uh, organic growth in, in revenue and EBIT, um, are actually those organizations that are uh, significantly better at monetizing their data. But again, you can only do this if you have the right architecture and the right controls in place to ensure data governance, to ensure that the data is only uh, used by the right people and for the right uses. So just a, a few final thoughts for my section. Um, data catalogs are key in any initiative for regulatory compliance as well as new initiatives. Um, you should think about minimizing the use of a PII, uh, the collection, storing, and use of PII, I should say. 
uh, because that will minimize the risk and the liability and the costs of compliance while allowing you to still derive insights. And when you think about your infrastructure, think that some of the companies that manage the most sensitive data are actually running on AWS. So AWS has been architected to uh, actually comply with all these processes, policies, uh, and programs for these organizations. And when you run on AWS, you are inheriting all of those characteristics. And with that, I will pass it over to my colleague Ashley from Tableau that she's going to talk about data literacy. Hello. Oh, you want this? Can you hear me now? OK, better. No feedback. That's much better. Hi. My name is Ashley Swain, and I have the pleasure of um, being here today with some really remarkable partners you know, many thanks to you all for joining us and to Slalom for putting this together with Snowflake and AWS. And this is actually the sixth time that we have presented together this year, and it's been a lot of fun. Now, I naturally think that my part is the best because I get to talk about people and our intersection with technology. And so let's start off with words. Um, who here considers him or herself a numbers person? Awesome but you probably communicate with words, am I right? Most of us probably since early childhood, something like that. Um, I love this quote from Jay Shetty, and I really love this image of the Earth rising over the surface of the moon, um, because 500 years ago, the Earth was flat. And by flat, I mean flat, and it was the center of the universe. Um, little known fact, most of us probably think it was round then like it is now. Am I right about that too? Does anyone here think the earth is flat? Okay, just checking. Good, good. <laughs> so how did things change? Um, well, there's a guy named Galileo. You've probably heard of him too. And he had heard about this theory that maybe the earth wasn't flat and maybe it wasn't the center of the universe. I actually echo Hillary's sentiments about the sunshine here in Las Vegas. Um, I live in also a very cold and rainy place, and I'm also thrilled that it's nice and sunny. Um, and Galileo may have been thinking something similar when he looked up at the sun one day and thought, oh, it's, um, may maybe the Earth is revolving around that. Maybe there's more to this than we think. And he's a very enterprising guy. And um, he didn't invent the telescope, but, but he, he came close to actually inventing the telescope. And what he did with it was actually collect data, something that probably a lot of us do, especially if you work in manufacturing, um, probably collecting a lot of data. And then he analyzed it. My, just lost my bike, sorry about that. Something that a lot of us also do. And uh, then he started talking about his analyses with peers, colleagues, um, the Duke of Pisa in his hometown. And he created a really compelling argument that the Earth was round. And it was so compelling that the Catholic Church actually formed an inquisition. This is a very big deal uh, because people can die if they're found to be uh, maybe not in line with the church's aligned power structures. And that's actually what happened to him. He wasn't killed. Um, but he was under house arrest because he challenged the status quo. And the, the church actually said, you're blasphemous. You've completely changed our accepted view of reality by collecting data and changing words that we use to discuss our reality. Um, this is something that probably a lot of us take for granted. When I was a customer, I did this every day. Actually, one of the first Tableau customers, um, it was my job to find out what we did not know about our organization, thus changing the realities of everyone who worked there for the better. Big responsibility. Um, so you just heard from Snowflake and AWS that we now have more data than we can count. We actually have to invent new words to quantify how much of it we have. It's every, and we were flooded in data. 
But, and yet, most organizations do not have a data-driven culture. Um, and by most, 92% are actually failing to scale analytics. Not just making mistakes, but failing. It's a big deal because, as you also heard, um, data is our most vital asset. According to The Economist, it's more valuable than oil. That's a big deal. So what do, oh, sorry about that. What do these successful 8% know that the others don't? Um, they know that it actually has nothing to do with technology or data. A culture of analytics is about people. It's about motivating human beings to change their perception of reality, reality. It's about motivating people to ask different questions. It's about curiosity. And it's about conversations. Um, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow, has anyone here read that? Wow, that's great. I bought it, I haven't read it, among many others. I have a nice stack, <laughs> called my aspirational list of books to read. Um, but he says some really important things in it. And one of them is that um, pattern recognition is actually learned intuition. So what the 8% of successful companies do is they enable the people in their organization to change how they recognize patterns. That evolved pattern recognition actually becomes intuition. We human beings will always make decisions based on intuition. The thing that we're learning is that we can actually evolve our own intuition. And we in organizations can do this programmatically through skills programs. Um, I learned how to use Tableau Desktop eight years ago. Um, since then, actually, I've worked with maybe some folks here to help you learn how to use it as well. And when we learn new skills, we learn how to ask and answer questions differently. So we actually are evolving our own systems of pattern recognition. And as Tableau customers, you can do this in your companies. You can do this for all the folks in your group. You can do it for hundreds of people at a time by focusing on what you need to accomplish and then designing skills programs that actually are aligned to help people do that together. It's very effective. Then, once you've done that, you can measure the efficacy of the programs that you've put in place. Um, Tableau has great features and functionality that allow you to do that, but I'm not here to talk about features and functionality. I'm here to talk about questions. So we have enabled, as have our partners, you and our other customers, to find out who is doing what well, and then do more of that. It's also really important to find out who is not doing what you think they should be doing, and then talk to them. Say, hey, were we wrong? Can you help me understand the gap between what we designed and what's actually happening? We might need to change course. Then, best practices. Best practices are as simple as telling people what fonts to use on a dashboard, telling them how to tell stories using data in your organization. That way you can make sure that people are having conversations that both sides understand. Because if you know one person is saying the earth is flat and the other is saying, pretty sure it's round, but hard to meet in the middle. So making sure that you have organizational standards for conversations and then actually how you design and use visual analytics is very, very important. I have a great customer story for you. Um, I'm actually a customer of theirs, as is everyone who works at Tableau. Is anyone here from Charles Schwab? No? All right. Well, Schwab is a great joint success story as well, um, and I am a customer of theirs. They also are a customer of mine for many years, and uh, it's a real privilege to be able to tell you a little bit about what they did to enable thousands of their employees across all areas of their business to succeed with analytics. They actually started with a community. Has anyone here ever been to a Tableau user group? 
Awesome. What's it like? Anyone? Fun. It's fun. Why is it fun? Because you're connecting with other people who have similar needs, similar questions, want to solve similar problems, and are interested in doing the same thing. They're also curious. That phrase, like attracts like, pretty true. So Schwab has its own internal Tableau user group. They also are highly involved in the community Tableau user groups. Um, I've been to their meetups in Denver and Phoenix. They do a great job. They also have gamified analytics skills programs. That's an excellent thing to do. It's an incentive. People want to learn new skills because you're telling them they will be rewarded. And they feel really good. Anyone here ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy? Awesome. That top part, self-actualization, is really important. And that's what these best practices are built to enable is self-actualization. When you help people grow and change their lives, they then help other people do the same because it feels really good. And Schwab has taken their whole organization on a mission to do this. They actually have integrated Salesforce and Tableau together so that if you were to walk into a Schwab branch, um, which I did a few weeks ago, they'll know exactly who you are, how many times you've been in. They'll have lots of analytics about you and then about your company and about the performance of funds that you've invested in at their fingertips. So what Schwab has done is they've enabled their frontline employees to make decisions about how to serve their customers, whether it's in person or in a call center, by integrating their data and their in analytics so that they can actually focus on the people who are coming to them who have a need for bringing business and revenue. This is also staggering. So those 8% of companies who are data-driven, who have successfully built cultures of data, are growing at about 27% year over year. That's a lot. That's a lot of growth. The companies who aren't doing this are failing. This is the survival of the fittest organizations. And the survival of the fittest is based on how well organizations can integrate their technological needs with the ability to help people change their behavior. And each of you here has the power to ask questions differently and evolve your culture right now. I'm gonna hand it back to Hillary to tell you a little bit about how. Test, can it, oh good, I'm working again. Thank you, Ashley, that was incredible, and thank you, Jorge and Todd. It's really incredible to see all the different tips in each of those elements and how these technology platforms are really enabling a culture of data. So whether you're on the launch pad, you're on route, you've landed on the moon, or you're already on your way to Mars, we wanted to leave behind a couple of small steps you can take on your giant leap toward a modern culture of data. Now, I'm gonna show you this quick maturity model. I am not draining this slide, but we will get you these slides so you can have them and you can review them later. This gives you a sense of launch pad versus on the moon, and you can see where you are in the journey. So here are some small steps. And we're gonna do this by element. Vision, quick question. How many of you feel like your company has a bold vision that you understand and it's clearly well articulated? Raise your hands. Good, good portion of you. For those of you where you feel like there's that good, bold vision, snap behind it, align your strategies and executions behind it, and drive marching toward that. Drive key results that align to that bold vision. If you are some of those folks who didn't raise your hands, take your sphere of influence and define your own bold vision. Come up with your own ideas, your own strategy, execute and commit against that. Transparency. Now remember, transparency is about broad accessibility to the data, so I, I call it radical transparency, so everybody can 
access the informa information they need at their fingertips. This is often not see seen as a small step implementing the data platforms to get you there. And I will say, don't build the field of dreams. I think a lot of people like to say, if I build it, they will come. Most companies are already doing this. They're taking an agile, iterative approach to the scalable data platforms. But what's great about the cloud is it makes you able to do this much more quickly and much more scalably than we could have done 20 years ago when I got my start in the data space. Embrace a coordinated silo approach. So for the sanctioned data that's really important, that's in your governed data structures and your data platforms. But for experimentation, enable an environment for experimentation. We have a client in Southern California, and what they've done is they've created personal data lakes. Kind of a neat concept. They basically allow people to, that are business people to use the corporate assets and then combine into cloud infrastructure that's pretty scalable their own additional data sources that they may want to blend together. It also does some checking on PII data, so it ensures that there's some compliance with GDPR and CCPA. So this is a really great way to provide that agility and accessibility. And if you're further along in the journey, think about how you can embed and automate. Francois talked about how they're embedding ML into everything they do in the platform. Think about doing the same thing in your organizations. How can you embed machine learning and automation so you make decision making even easier, kind of like our Google when we're going and trying to decide when to leave for the airport. Guardianship. Now this is all about trust in the data. And this was the balancing act. What I will say about guardianship is this is a team sport. And everybody seems to point to the other side and say, hey, they're not keeping the data safe or the business users don't know how to use it. It is a team sport. The business users understand the data, and the technologists know where to find the data. And so the first baby step is to have a combined guardianship steering committee that pulls from multiple teams. And then, as a group, evaluate the trade-offs of accessibility and guardianship and agree on what that tenant is going to be. And I'm going to have all of, well, maybe not all of you in this room, but I make some people uncomfortable, err on the side of accessibility. I know that may be an unusual uh, dictate, particularly after Jorge scared us with all those regulations. But we want to make sure that innovation is accessible. And so we want to make sure that's there. So do that embrace siloed approach where you can protect GDPR but and personally identifiable information. However, err on accessibility. Data security and PII is actually not just a technology problem. This is a lot about policies and procedures and people as well. So educate people on their responsibility on keeping your data secure. And lastly, if you're further along in your journey, build the de-identified data lake that Jorge was talking about. Now, literacy, this is speaking the language of data. I know a lot of you know this really well. Ashley did a great job of articulating a lot of the things that if you've seen Blueprint, it is very well articulated how you can move the needle in the literacy department. Find champions and evangelize. Build community, engage and support. Build those reusable templates so people don't have to figure it out each time. Do data 101s. Embed how-to. And, and wherever possible, make it so intuitive that you practically don't even need to do a how-to. I think about with my mobile device, my dad is 86 years old. He would never touch Excel because it was too complicated. In his era, he didn't need to do that. He had people actually who typed for him. But when it came to the mobile device, he, he like took to it, like he sends me selfies all the time, it's crazy. It was so easy for him, everything was embedded in the how-to. So the, the trend is to make it so easy that anybody and everybody can use data to make a decision. And make it fun. That's what the gamification is all about. And the last 
step in the last area is that culture component. This is the hard component, because culture, everybody says it's really hard, it's really nebulous, but there are concrete things you can do. Culture stems from trust and safety. So when, I, when you feel safe and comfortable in an environment, that builds trust. If you start to model and reward the behaviors you want to see, that further builds that trust. A great example, we have our president did a great job of modeling data-driven decision making. He was in a meeting about a month ago, and he started the meeting with a graph. And he said, here are our survey results on our decision making process. The highlights are we're really good at executing against our strategy. And then he flipped it to the lowlights and he said, but nobody seems to understand our decision making process. That was the lowest rated in our most recent survey. He used data and then he went on to explain a new program they're rolling out around decision making. Clearly articulated, modeled behavior, it was an excellent way to show that data-driven culture. Empowered decision-making, all too often, there are layers in the way of empowering people who are the closest to the data. Try to get rid of those if you can. And then ultimately communicate, communicate, because that's how you build trust and safety. I'm just gonna wrap up. For those of you not familiar with Slalom, we're a modern consulting firm focused on strategy, technology, and business transformation. We don't resell software. We partner with the products that we believe share similar values to ours, which is sustained innovation. And AWS, Tableau, and Snowflake are incredible examples of that. I'm gonna, if you're interested in getting started, we have a couple of Moonshot offerings. If you wanna get started with a workshop to a full scale modern culture of data, uh, assessment and strategy project. I want to wrap up with a final story. Back in the space race, there was a reporter that went to NASA and interviewed this gentleman and said, hey, what do you do here? The gentleman said, I'm putting a man on the moon. Turned out this gentleman was a janitor. Modern culture of data is where everyone in your organization, from the janitor to the CEO, is empowered to make decisions with data. Thank you.